Well, it is seven o'clock. We don't, we're probably going to have some people drifting in for a few minutes after we get started. Um, so I'll just kind of start with welcome to the October CFIS um, meeting and um, and election, our annual uh, officers election. So in keeping with our recent changes, we're doing the quarterly um, star party. And then in between, we're still going to do the uh, the Zoom meetings. Um, and we'll be recording this and posting it on our YouTube channel uh, later on uh, for everybody. Uh, only members are um, allowed to participate in the live Zoom meetings. That could change in the future, but that's, that's currently the um, uh, the model that we're that we're going with. First, I hope everyone did okay with um, the hurricane. I know um, a lot of people in the area, even as far away from the you know the, the landfall as we were, uh, have gone through a lot of hardship. I was just talking to a friend today who's. Um, you know, people, lots of flooding, lots of flooding um, uh, in areas where flooding was not expected. A lot of um, a lot of cars underwater and uh, homes intruded on and things like that. So um, I'm just acknowledging that uh, I know a lot of people have had a, a hard way to go here the last couple of weeks, and I hope uh, I hope you're doing well. Uh, myself, I have nothing to complain about. Minor damage. Um, nothing to the house uh, that couldn't be cleaned up with chainsaws. So um, very fortunate uh, in that regard. So back to astronomy. Uh, tonight, we're going to have uh, some, of course, club news and announcements first, uh, tell you about what's going on. Uh, there may be a few things I forgot to put uh, in the announcements. Um, if so, one of the board members, feel free to jump in and um, you know and, and talk about it. I believe, Derek, um, I did not put your Halloween event uh, on here, but please, I'd love for you to to get say a few words about that uh, before we get going with the other programs. Um, officers' elections, uh, we'll we'll kind of put that off a little bit so that we have uh, uh, make sure some stragglers have have logged in. Elaine Fisher is going to give us one of her famous in the news segments. Things going on in the world of astronomy uh, in the news. There is a lot going on. Uh, she could probably talk an hour about that uh, if we let her. John Pinto is going to talk about what's up tonight and is going to give us a review of the RASC Observer's Handbook. That's the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada Observer's Handbook, a, um, an annual favorite of many uh, astro uh, astronomers. Um, and then the main program, which I put last, uh, is uh, astrophotography best practices. Uh, we had a little bit of a, another uh, emergency. So I pulled this one out of uh, out of, of the bin and dusted off. This is based on a four-hour workshop that I did out west uh, a couple of years ago. It will not be a four-hour presentation. I kind of uh, pared it down a little bit, and I'll I'll go through some of it quickly. Um, but I will not be talking for four hours, uh, obviously. So let me click on the right thing. We do need a webmaster. Uh, if you have experience. Uh, maintaining and enhancing websites. Uh, we have a job for you. Uh, please let us know. Email president at cephas.org if you are interested. Uh, our website is pretty static right now. Uh, very little maintenance needs to be done. It's primarily making sure email forwarders are set up correctly or uh, that sort of thing. Uh, but if you um, are a visual designer, maybe with web experience or a web programming ninja, and you want to add some pop and zing, uh, to our website, uh, we would um, we would love to have you uh, join the board and take that on. Um, currently, the website is our is primarily a portable to the to the general public more than being used by our membership. Things change over time. Many years ago, you know, the website had a chat room and we did everything through that. Today, we do everything through Groups.io. If you're a member, you should have gotten information about Groups.io in your welcome letter. Uh, to let you know how to join Groups.io, and uh, we send out all of our official notices, Groups.io, and we upload meeting minutes and all that sort of thing to the Groups.io um, forum and file repositories. So other board news, uh, we, I'm very happy to announce that the outreach chair is filled. I was afraid we were going to have to just simply start saying no to people. Uh, for outreach. Thank you very much, Douglas Woods, who can be reached at now at outreach um, at cephas.org. And Doug, um, 
Doug asked to say a few things. I was going to ask him to say a few things anyway. Uh, but Doug, would you like to um, say a few words as our, our new outreach chair? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Presumably oh. everyone else can too. All right. Well, fortunately, I've shooed the cats away. You won't hear them. Um, I, I just like to say, uh, you know, I, I welcome the opportunity to um, uh, to work with outreach, and uh, you know, do what I can um, to keep up standards. I know we've uh, done a lot and have done it well over the years, and I'm new to all this, so you know, don't hit too hard if you feel the need. It's okay. <laughs> We do have three requests for outreach uh, coming up next week. Now, unfortunately, I will not be available. Uh, I will be on a cruise to some part of the Caribbean. I don't remember which. I probably won't get off the boat, uh, so it doesn't matter that much. Uh, but be that as it may, we have one request for um, Mill Creek Elementary in Kissimmee on the 21st. Uh, a rather strange one from Trinity Prep in um, Winter Park on the 21st and or the 22nd. Uh, they were just uh, going to be channeling people out of their theater um, to look through telescopes after a presentation of a new play called um, Silent Nights or something nights. Um, and then Orlando Science Center on the 22nd. Um, I'm a little leery of committing anything to the Trinity Prep um, opportunity, though it's probably more local for more people than Kissimmee, uh, only because they're not very definite about times when we would start or where we might set up. And I really don't have um, or haven't had a chance to talk to anybody there. Um, does anybody think this would be a, a good thing to pursue, or can we kind of deprioritize it in favor of the other two uh, um, requests? Or is that an inappropriate question? You're the outreach chair. You get to decide what's appropriate. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I'm looking for a, a little nudge to say, yeah, that's all right. Or, you know, yeah, you're doing yeah. It wrong. yeah, that's, that, that's fine. And, you know, um, I'll remind you and everyone else again, the outreach chair does, does not have to be there. Uh, the outreach chair hopefully will have a legion of volunteers uh, that he can send out. Uh, but we cannot say yes to every uh, event. Um, and if events kind of up in the air, um, you know, I, people have lives it's not like well i don't have anything to do all week just let me know call me and i'll pick up and run out there right away so you know if they can't nail it down um and you may find some people who are willing to who are that flexible but um all right well yeah, tell you, you, what, only have, you only have so many volunteers to burn <laughs> and i'm looking forward to meeting them all so i will be um posting uh either later tonight or tomorrow first thing tomorrow um a call for volunteers and see okay. what kind of re re response we get back. But I haven't committed us to anything with any of these groups yet. I just want to make sure that I know someone will be there before I say, yeah, sure, we'll show up. That's an extremely good policy to have, yes. All right, well, yes. that's it for me, right. Doug. More than Thank you, you probably wanted to hear. No, and welcome aboard, Doug. Welcome aboard. Um, Derek, do you want to say a few words about uh, the upcoming planetarium event? Because that's also sort of an outreach opportunity for the club. It's the 27th, I believe. Yes. So uh, for those that have been around for quite some time, um, we usually host our spooky star party. Um, but uh, the planetarium uh, is, is obviously still closed. We actually suffered some water damage during the hurricane and uh, some mold issues. So we are definitely trying to keep people out of that area uh, for the foreseeable future. It's delaying some of our renovation plans. Um, basically, uh, what we're doing is the uh, Seminole County Sheriff's Department is putting together a safe, safe <laughs> trunk or treat style event on October 27th from 6 to 8 p.m. Um, though I've been told it's going to probably run until 9 p.m. or later, depending on how many people show up that night. 
And um, I spoke with the lady that was in charge of the event, and uh, they asked if we would be interested in helping. And I decided that what better way to continue the legacy of the Spooky Star Party um, that we normally host this time of year and align it with this event. So this is Thursday, October 27th. Um, you will see that I have made a post on the groups.io page. I'll also be doing a post uh, soon on the Facebook page, but I believe most of our members are now on the groups.io. Uh, so details on this event can be found on that po uh, post I made in the groups.io, um, including date, time, things like that, location. There is a pin uh, on the Google Maps um, uh, pin. Uh, there's a link to it. If you go to the groups.io message that I mentioned, it says the Halloween uh, extravaganza event. Um, you click on that pin link and it'll show you exactly where it's over in the automotive um, parking lot, which is on the opposite side of the campus where the planetarium is. Very large parking lot. And we are getting a nice, decent chunk of real estate to set up telescopes, as well as have several display tables. I've had several volunteers already um uh, and 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 also we are encouraged to bring candy or other things to give out to the children that come to this event again this is a safe trick-or-treat style event uh it is required to wear costumes so if you're not somebody who likes to get into the halloween spirit this event is definitely not for you but if you definitely do like the halloween spirit and you want to dress up in costume and have a good time this is an event for you uh, the estimated attendance is between 1,000 to 2,000 people. Um, this is one of the biggest events that the Seminole County Sheriff's Department puts together throughout the year. So we're happy to be able to align ourselves with this event. Basically, people will be walking around various different areas and will be one of those particular sites. So um, 6 o'clock to, to uh, about 9 p.m. The only caveat about this event, which unfortunately is not under my control, uh, this was given to me as a request by the actual event planner for the Seminole County Sheriff's Department, and that is uh, setup time is between 2.30 p.m. to 4.30 p.m. So unfortunately, I know this is a Thursday. This might hinder a lot of you to event to um, plan to help out. But if you have the ability to take this time off to help, we unfortunately do have to have be set up before 4.30. That's just unfortunately what the Sheriff's Department wishes to do. Um, so unfortunately, if you cannot set up by 430, they are not going to admit anybody to come in to the event after that. Again, this is not this is not me talking. This is the sheriff's department's request. They will be providing uh, pizza and other snacks before the event starts. So uh, there will be some food and drink um, available for volunteers. Um, but if you need any more, more information, reach me at my email. I will post it in the chat um uh, demeter d at seminalstate.edu if you're interested in volunteering um you can always email me directly i'm going to be sending out a full email and uh including our new outreach chair the details on that that can be disseminated out to the membership so that's all i got i hope to see you there this is a great chance for us to resurrect the spooky star party uh until the planetarium reopens so thank you so okay. much Thanks, Derek. I have one follow-up question. Now, since this is not your show, so to speak, um, it runs till nine o'clock. There's not really going to be uh, hanging around till after that, right? Um, people are going to have to pack up. Yes, this is not a, an outreach or a observing event as well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So this is uh, primarily once uh, the event is done, um, everybody will be um, yeah. asked to um, yeah. to leave. I know at a, a lot of the you know past events that was the case, and I thought this does not sound like that. And um, yeah, I thought I'd just bring that up ahead of time. Um, we do have a question, real quick, Richard, if I can answer it. It's sure. uh, solar viewing at SSC. Um, so um, of course the sun may still be up by the time it's, the event starts. So um, it will be pretty close to the horizon. But if you have a spot where it's available, you're more than welcome to set up to view the sun. Um, Primary targets, obviously, are going to be Jupiter, Saturn, uh, maybe the Pleiades, some other objects that are fairly bright in the parking lot. Um, so, but uh, yeah, you're if you if you are able to view the sun, um, you're you're welcome to do that. Yeah, and Jupiter and Saturn can both be seen in the daytime. 
So just pointing that out that if you can find it, uh, it they're quite visible on a telescope during the day. Okay, so then uh, next item on the agenda is our board election. Uh, according to our bylaws, this is the October meeting. We did present the current slate uh, last meeting. Uh, now uh, taking over for me uh, for president will be Tricia Smedley, who is our former uh, vice president. Um, for vice president, Frank Kane, former member of the board and a great asset uh, to the club. Uh, Secretary Denise Woody retaining her role and Treasurer Kent Ellingham. And we have joining us uh, as our new board member, as our new board member at large, Mark Pernall. Eric Hoyne is the former board member at large who's going out. Uh, board members at large are elected for two-year terms and um, they and and they just rotate rotate out each year. There's a there's a new one that that slides in. Um, Typically, since we don't have um, since we don't have a different um, different people running for president, uh, we don't have to do a secret ballot. We can do a show of hands, and Derek has prepared uh, has prepared um, a poll. But to make things official, um, someone needs to motion that we just accept the slate as it is. And since nobody can do that, you could do it in the Q and A, perhaps. But we need a member. It could be a board member or a general member to make that motion. I, move I, believe, that you're, we... I believe you're able to raise your hand. So if you do want okay. to make a motion, um, you can raise your hand and I can um, allow you to talk. Okay. Well, since I already have the privilege, I'll go ahead and move that we accept the slate as uh, presented. Thank you. Looks like Bill Castro, we could count him as a second. And, um, all in favor, raise their hands. I see lots of hands up without counting. I don't see hardly any hands down. A few people have not raised their hand. That's okay, you can abstain, but we have, it's definitely well over half. So the motion carries and we'll accept the slate as is. Um, I guess we could do the hands again, but Derek went through the trouble of making a, a poll. So let's go ahead and run the poll, Derek. And one vote per member, if you are- a So the, the other is, unfortunately the poll doesn't allow me to make one uh, choice. Oh. So that's where the other is. But if you do have somebody you like to, uh, to add, um, you could always select other and then post in the- uh, uh, chat uh, the the Q and A, <laughs> but okay. Uh, okay. Um, it seems like our results are in seventy one percent. Okay, so we have twenty out of twenty eight. Um, everybody has essentially selected. We are well over the majority. The fifty percent majority. Yep. Okay, uh, I'm going to click share results just so everybody can see it if they want. No shenanigans going on. Welcome new board members. Ah! Trisha and Frank, brand new. Uh, well, back to the board and uh, Mark Pernal as well as our board member at large. Thank you very much. And all right, so what's next on the agenda? Um, it's showtime. So uh, Elaine Fisher, What's going on, man? What's going on in the like astronomy news? I think you've got some stuff for us. I'm going to quit sharing so that you can share. Now you were saying that uh, you didn't have any damage at your house that couldn't be handled with a chainsaw. I was out all day in Wakiva Springs State Park helping them with their chainsaw work. For the, uh, well, I'm impressed because uh, I hired a crew with chainsaws. <laughs> I did not do it myself. <laughs> Well, we had a whole crew, the Florida Trail Association. Uh, so we did have a big crew. Very good. Okay. Why have I lost my page that allows me to share? There we go. <laughs> oh. Given away the ending. 
No, you're not sharing yet. Oh, okay. I see nothing. I see nothing. Share screen. Should pop up, up, up. Elaine Fisher has started screen sharing. It looks like you clicked the right thing. Okay, it came up. It did. I see your PowerPoint in the news. Okay. Um, I periodically do a little bit that I call in the news, uh, various things I pick up from a whole variety of different sources. And uh, Richard asked me to present a couple of them tonight. So for October 2022, Hurricane Ian's impact on CFIS. having to do with Merritt Island National Wildlife Refuge and the Canaveral National Seashore. How does that impact CFIS? For those who have been around for a while, remember this Biolab boat ramp. Um, there's been some pretty good viewing out there, but they had damage. Now, because the, the uh, extent of the hurricane, the US Fish and Wildlife Service sent an entire task force into the state. You can see this truck is from Minnesota um, to, stand, to stand by to help with the damage. And let me see if I can do this. So they were out there in, uh, on, play. They were, they've been out in um, Merritt Island working on the road and you can see there was significant damage to the road out there. Lots of washouts. But they're doing some fill, getting the road back in shape. And then this is one of my friends took this picture, but you see he has his hand raised in the sign of success. So they have the uh, Biolab uh, boat ramp open again. All right, back to the slides. Looking to 2023. The 2023 Sky and Telescope Observing Calendar is available. And they described it as gorgeous astrophotography and special monthly sky scenes illustrating the positions of the moon and bright planets and highlighting sky events each month, including eclipses, meteor showers, and conjunctions. Um, they have their online store here. And since this is being recorded, that will be available through Facebook and, uh, and YouTube. So if anyone is interested in getting the 2023 Sky and Telescope Observing Calendar, um, it does have a number of um, interesting things highlighted in it. 1999, and it said taxes and shipping will be calculated at checkout. I don't know what that means, but sometimes you need to be careful with that. Now, a while back, I came across something that described what space smells like. And you think, what? Space having a smell? Well, it was an article in the magazine Real Simple in the June 2022 issue, and uh, it was entitled Smells Like Space. And this is the entire um, article. And I, brought, I just picked out a few highlights for you. What does space smell like according to this article? Now, of course you can't breathe or really smell in space, but 
It's been described as rum and raspberries, and I'll tell you where this information comes from in a moment. Seared steak and burning metal and rotten eggs. Now I'm sure we all can imagine where the rotten egg smell comes from. But um, from this, and as I said, I'll get back to where the, the uh, description of the smells comes from. From this, CNN described it as space, the final fragrance. And someone has come up with eau de space perfume. And you see it has a little astronaut logo behind the eau de space on the box and the bottle. I don't know how much this costs, um, but I'm sure you can find it online. So the smell of space, the developer of this originally worked on a scent exhibition to recreate the smell inside the Mir space station. Can you imagine what the Mir space station might smell like? It's how many years has it been up there? So I don't know if that is a particular fragrance I would be interested in wearing. Anyway, in 2008, uh, this same developer was contracted by NASA to develop a similar scent. And they described it as ozone, hot metal and fried steak, or just like, like a just fired gun. And they said, this is intended to help train astronauts to minimize potential surprises. So this is some of our tax dollars at work coming up with a fragrance so the astronauts aren't surprised at what things smell like when they get to space. The company wants to stimulate interest in STEM. So they're also, apparently they've been successful with their smell of space um, fragrance. Now they're working on smell of the moon. Now, um, where these aromas come from is as astronauts have come back from spacewalks, other astronauts have described particular aromas coming from their spacesuits. And they describe them as hot metal, seared meat, ozone, sulfurous or gunpowder. And one of them described it as sweet smelling welding fumes someone who uh, did a little welding in a past life. So in the process of recreating the smell of space for the scent, uh, the developer used dry distilled birch tar for the smokiness, helichrysum flower for the hot metal meatiness. And apparently this flower is, has an aroma of hot bacon in a floral form. And then they added anise for acridness. So they took the, the uh, smells that other astronauts described as um, emanating from the spacesuits after spacewalks and distilled it down to these, created a fragrance which is successful. And now they're working on Sense of the Moon. I didn't know space had a smell. And finally, um, when I Googled the sense of space in the article that talked about this fragrance, it had, NASA is offering $35,000 in prizes to design a toilet that will work on the moon. And there is somebody, um, I guess, testing one. So who are we gonna call to help with that? Now, I don't think his was a toilet on the moon. I think it was a toilet in a space station. But Howard Wallowitz has a little experience with space toilets, not necessarily successful. And that's in the news. Thanks, Julie. I think in my spacesuit, the smell of seared meat would be very disconcerting. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, would, I would think so. That would that would bother me. Um, up next is John Pinto. I do not see him um, on the list. 
Are you here uh, under a different name, John, perhaps? I know if he's not here, he's probably having an emergency of some sort because I spoke to him just, well, there were some email exchanges very recently. I, I Yeah, I sent him a message and uh, no response yet, so. Okay, I know he was on tonight for two and um, I know he was active not long right before the meeting. So I hope, uh, hope all is well with John. Um, I will just go ahead and start mine. If John shows up, um, let me know so I don't go too late uh, so that we can make sure and get his two, uh, his two talks in. I'll go ahead and share my screen. And too many icons. Where, there it is. That is not the right one. Dun, dun, dun. Okay, so best practices in astrophotography. I uh, hope this will be an inter of interest to uh, many of our members. Uh, this is for, you know, talking about, I'll be talking a little bit about DSLR as well as deep space uh, photography. Um, uh, so, um, so what are best practices though? Um, commercial and professional procedures that are acceptable or prescribed. Uh, in my in my professional work, uh, we talk a lot about best practices uh, when an engineer or a developer does something is coloring outside the lines to say, you know, that's not really best practices. Usually it gets you in trouble. Uh, and usually it results from being uh, either lazy or inexperienced when you violate best practices. And so this is a list. There is no international committee on uh, best practices for astrophotography. So I came up with these and you can uh, certainly disagree with me if you like. Um, and, uh, you know, we could we could talk about it over a a beer or something sometime. Uh, best practices are not, uh, you know, rules of thumb. I think best practices are a little more nuanced. A rule of thumb is a blunt uh, explanation to help someone uh, who does not understand um, a great deal of the technical details about what they're doing. So we'll come up with a rule of thumb, just kind of help them. Rule of thumbs sometimes don't work. Uh, and they're usually a blanket a very high level blanket explanation for something uh, that's a little bit more refined. And if you want, if you want to get, you know, if you want to bring your results up a level, um, you stop using rules of thumb, you start going a little deeper. Uh, best practices are mostly not things you found on cloudy nights. Uh, it's not something that insert famous imager here does, and it works for him. Uh, lots of great imagers, you know, um, I'm not going to, I'm not sliding any of them. Uh, but, you know, just because my friend Warren Keller says he does this this way doesn't mean that's the best way to do it uh, for everybody. Uh, or I get good images when I do it this way. Um, you know, I can drive a nail with a screwdriver if I work hard enough. And if I practice and I only ever use a screwdriver for years and years and years, I could make an amazing YouTube video of how I drive a nail in with a screwdriver. But that does not mean it's the best tool uh, for it. Um, you know, this is how I've always done it means, you know, that's, that's definitely, uh, not that that's not necessarily a big practice. And, uh, you know, I've never needed to do that before. Uh, well, that's fine. Don't, you know, that that's okay, but that's whatever. Um, then there's a, I have 87 I, a pods do what I do. Uh, well, he's got 87 a pods. I guess I should do what he does. Uh, and he says to do it this way. Uh, you know, best practices are a, a bit more objective and less subjective. Uh, subjective is sort of a touchy feely. Uh, it looks pretty and I don't really care. And that's fine. A lot of people observe uh, and image just for the fun of it. Uh, a lot of people use a camera as an observing tool just to go, they go, you know, they spend five minutes on a target. They go from object to object to object all night. Five minutes on a top target just so that they can see more on a computer screen than I might see on a camera. And that's fine. I'm not, absolutely, I am not saying there's anything wrong with that. Uh, I'm not saying um, that that's a lesser form of observing or practicing your astronomy or anything else. Uh, but these are best practices for people who are interested in doing a photography and want to get the best results uh, from that photography at some point. Uh, many people want to start measuring themselves against others, and that's how we improve and get better. It's why we keep score at the Olympics. 
So a good example of a rule of thumb is the rule of 500s. Uh, this is about how long can I expose on a tripod with my camera uh, before the stars start to trail. And uh, the rule of thumb here is divide 500 by your focal length. And that tells you how many seconds you can go. So if you have a, a 24 millimeter lens, uh, divide 500 by 24. And so you can expose for 20 seconds. Um, and uh, uh, you know, without the stars trailing. And of course, if you have a crop sensor, you have to change the focal length based on the uh, the crop because the crop changes the focal length of your lens. This is, of course, utter manure. Uh, to be polite, you have uh, you have failed basic optics. Do not pass go. Do not collect two hundred dollars. It does work most of the time, sort of, kind of. Uh, it's a good place to start for somebody who's never done anything before and who doesn't want to sit through a workshop, uh, but um, it's not necessarily uh, true. Here's a good example. Um, these are, uh, this is a field of view indicator I created with the sky uh, with uh, software. Um, this is two telescopes with two different cameras. One is a 1000 millimeter telescope and one is a 400 millimeter telescope. And you can see the field of view is almost identical. And the small sensor on the 400 millimeter telescope did not turn that telescope into a thousand millimeter telescope, uh, not by not by any shot. So how can I tell? How long can I go on a tripod? There's really only two things that uh, that answer that question. Really, uh, image scale, uh, which is how big are your um, how big are your pixels, and it's determined by how big are your pixels and how what focal length do you have. It also depends on where you're pointing in the sky. Uh, different parts of the sky will move faster than other parts in the sky uh, when you're on a tripod. In particular, to the north, uh, moves more slowly, which is why when you're doing deep sky photography, by the way, if your alignment is off or you've got bad periodic error in your mount, targets to the north, um, you'll have less trouble with than part uh, than targets to uh, the south or closer to um, closer to the to the equator um, equator. If you're going really wide. Uh, it'll actually vary throughout your frame. Uh, you can have one part of the frame where the stars are moving faster than another part of the frame. And so you'll get some frame, some parts of the frame where the stars are a little longer than others. And most people, when they look at that, they'll go, oh, I need a new lens because, you know, it's really nice in the middle, but out at the edge, it's only at the left edge, uh, you know, towards Orion, but the stars are really uh, trailing a little bit. Well, that might mean you need a new lens. It might also mean uh, that the sky is moving at different rates, uh, which it does. So what is the best practice and how long can you go on a tripod? Best practice is very simple. Don't be lazy. Uh, guess if you have to start with the rule of 500 or sometimes it's the rule of 300. Um, the, and the reason crop sensors way back whenever this first started, they go, well, crop sensors, you gotta take into account the focal length. No. Uh, full frame sensors had big pixels and the first generation of crop sensors had tiny pixels and it was that pixel scale that was different. It wasn't that the sensor was any smaller and the stars would move across them any better. It was that the pixels were uh, were smaller. But, uh, you know, why is it important anyway, isn't it? Why can't I just, you know, why, why, um, why do I need to know? Oh, I said, do, don't be lazy. I forgot to kind of tell you what to do. Um, take a tip, take a picture. Zoom in on it and look at it. If the stars are trailed, shorten your exposure. This is what we call an algorithm in computer programming. Uh, if you take an exposure and the stars are trailed, shorten the exposure, take another one. If the stars are still trailed, shorten the exposure some more, take another one. When you get to where the stars aren't trailed, that's the longest you can go without trailed stars, at least in the middle uh, of your field. Now, it's very tempting to go a little bit longer and let the stars trail because especially if you're shooting the Milky Way, you get a really bright image because you've exposed longer. But part of the reason you're getting a bright image because you expose longer is because instead of the stars taking up a few pixels, they're trailed, which means they're spread over more pixels. And overall, the brightness of your image on your viewfinder, it looks like a beautiful very bright, vibrant Milky Way, but you've actually smeared the Milky Way. The technical term for that is called blurry, by the way, uh, but you smeared it. Uh, like you can see in this star trail shot that I shot, where did I shoot this? Texas Star Party. Uh, this is actually the Milky Way um, over, over a couple of hours, but you can see it's very, very bright because the starlight's been spread across many, many pixels. Um, and 
you really you just need to get to know your gear uh, by practice and experimentation. Uh, and like I said, don't be lazy. Take a couple of test shots. Check it out. If you have a great photograph on Facebook, the most insulting thing anybody ever will say to you is, well, you must have a nice camera because to take really good uh, photos takes, of course, a little bit of work and it takes some skill and practice. It's not just simply buying a new a good camera. And this is one of the ways in which you can kind of up your photography, your astro, your deep sky, I mean, your uh, your nightscape photography uh, just a little bit. Keep your stars round uh, so that you can blow up the image uh, and it has a nice crisp um, uh, feel to it. I will actually give a shout out to uh, my my peer here at Cephas, Derek Demeter, some of his nightscapes, the Milky Way. They have a very nice um, they have a very nice feel to them that I often don't see in other people's Milky Way images. And part of that uh, is he controls uh, star trailing uh, a bit. Um, another important factor uh, when you're doing astrophotography of any kind is uh, seeing and transparency. And I've even talked to vendors at star parties who didn't know the difference between uh, seeing and transparency. Uh, this is a video of the moon and you can see how maybe you can see uh, how it's jittering all around uh, when you're when you're looking at the moon. If you're taking a picture of the Horsehead Nebula, guess what? It's doing the same exact same thing. You, if you want nice round stars, you have to bear in mind those stars are jumping all over the place. And this is a very important factor when you're doing uh, astrophotography. This seeing uh, is measured in arc seconds, which is basically how big are your stars, because stars are effectively infinitely far away, and they should only be uh, like a tiny, tiny point on your sensor or on your eyepiece when you're looking at it. But the stars get moved all around. They're jumping back and forth. And so they'll get very, they'll get large uh, based on the seeing or the atmospheric stability. Great thing about Florida, we are famed for our seeing in the wintertime. We have very stable skies in the wintertime. Uh, some of the early pioneers, Don Parker down in Miami, uh, doing planetary uh, lucky imaging with webcams, uh, taking advantage of that uh, of that very still uh, seeing. And even today, people like Christopher Goh and Damian Peach, you know, they're out on islands in the Pacific or the Caribbean, and that's where they we have that smooth air uh, over those islands, like we do over Florida, and they can get those really high resolution shots because the air is not jumping around uh, quite so much. When we look at a star, this is a buzzword. Uh, you'll see full width half maximum, the FWHM, full width half max. And that is a measure of how big a diameter is the, is half of the intensity of the star. I don't have a 3D graph here to show you, but uh, on a really tight star here, all of the energy is, you know, in that tiny little dot, the, the, the optics are going to focus that into a nice little dot. And if the star is moving or not moving around a lot, you'll get a nice small dot. Now, this also assumes you've not saturated. If you overexpose it, uh, the stars get bigger. And I'll explain why that happens, too, in a minute. Uh, but when, when we talk about full width half maximum, about half of the energy is in this little circle here. Half of the, uh, the other half of the energy is actually spread out outside the circle, uh, spread out quite a ways outside the circle, in fact. But because it's so thin outside of that full width half max size, uh, we uh, we normally don't see it because it doesn't show up unless you stretch it really, really hard in your uh, photography software. Uh, the star will start to get big. When you overexpose a star and it saturates, we call it, um, all that energy that you can't hardly see that's spilling out starts to build up. And so stars will get much larger when you overexpose them. So if you're trying to measure the full width half max or the, the seeing of the sky, make sure you don't overexpose the star. Even if you're not overexposing, the atmospheric turbulence can make the stars much bigger. Uh, in fact, they can get to a point where there's no point in even imaging. You should probably just go home or shoot really wide field stuff instead of um, uh, in, instead of you know trying to shoot a deep space object or Saturn or the planets or the moon or something. Uh, another common thing I'll see is people using 
uh, autofocus software. Uh, it doesn't matter whether you're using Focus Max or Hocus Focus, uh, Nina, or At Focus 2 or At Focus 3. People go, well, my focus isn't very good. Um, well, sometimes, yeah, if your focuser is slipping a little bit, the focusing software can't do a very good job. But very often, you get a good focus and the seeing is just not very good. You cannot focus past what the atmospheric seeing will let you. Uh, and so, you know, no matter what you do, no matter how well focused are, you are, you're going to get an image like on the bottom where things are a bit softer and, uh, and, and more blurry. And that's just the atmosphere is bouncing those things around. It's like trying to take a photograph of something at the bottom of a swimming pool. And you know, during the day when it's very bright, you can freeze that. Uh, it's what we do with lucky imaging when we're shooting the moon or the planets. We take very short exposures because, well, the moon is pretty bright. It's like 800,000 times brighter than you know, a typical nebula. So you have to do a very long exposure and that water's moving around and that object's going to get blurred and spread all over the place. And you're just not going to be able to get good, uh, good seeing. Seeing is typically very bad after a thunderstorm or a, a, a front moves through, the air is very turbulent. Um, if you're shooting wide field, you got like a 200 millimeter camera lens or maybe even shorter. Uh, even when the seeing is very bad, you can get very nice results because again, your pixel scale is going to be huge and you know, a star on the pixels isn't going, is not going to get spread over very many pixels because, uh, because you're so wide and the stars are going to be so small, uh, comparatively. The other word or, uh, the other weather word is called is transparency. A lot of people confuse seeing and transparency, but transparency is nothing more than the clearness or you know how soupy or hazy uh, is uh, is the night. Usually, uh, transparency improves with elevation. Um, uh, some start targets still work okay with less than ideal transparency. Uh, the moon and the planets, for example, I found oddly enough, uh, hydrogen alpha narrow band sometimes doesn't mind. Um, in Florida, the summer times transparency is horrible. Even we'll get a nice clear sky in June or August. Uh, but uh, those of you who live here, you know what happens. There's all this water in the atmosphere. It's horrible. And then as soon as the temperature drops just a few degrees at night, the air turns soupy. And so you don't see nearly as many stars, even under a, even on a clear evening. And if you're trying to do astrophotography, of course, uh, you've got to work through that uh, these soupy conditions. And if you're patient, you can you can pull some, you can pull a rabbit out of your hat and you can make it work if you're desperate enough. Uh, typically though, I only I'll reserve it for really bright objects uh, in the summertime. Best weather app I know of for telling you what the pixel uh, the seeing and the transparency is uh, of course the, the world famous clear sky clock. Uh, this is from uh, Kent. This is from the Winter Star Party site. Um, the darker the blue, the better. Um, this is a pretty good night. Uh, really dark blue for transparency, uh, even darker for seeing. Ah, that that really dark for seeing right here, that's planet night. Uh, you want to shoot some planets on that night. If you get really dark blocks, all three, we call that triple dark blue. No matter what you got planned, no matter what PTA meeting or otherwise, it's canceled. When you get a triple dark blue night, you're out. Uh, you're out into the sky with your with your gear. Now I talked about pixel scale. Um, let's do uh, not too deep a dive, but we'll do a little bit of math here. Uh, how much sky? What what is that? How much sky does your pixel capture? It depends on how big the pixel is, and it depends on the focal length of the optic. It does not depend on the size of the sensor. It does depend on the size of the pixels or the photoreceptor sites would be more accurate. Uh, and a very simple equation, you divide the pixel size in microns. Most of the time, camera manufacturers will list the pixel size in microns for you. Uh, and you divide it by the focal length of the telescope in millimeters. If you're using a focal reducer or a a, uh, or Barlow or something, you have to take that into account with the focal length. Notice how the focal length does not change with chip size. Yes, I will quit beating that dead horse um, in a minute. And then we'll multiply that by scaling factor of 206.3 because 
math. Uh, so for example, if you have 4.45 microns and a 600 millimeter scope, then each pixel is going to represent 1.54 arc seconds of sky. So, okay, so my pixel is 1.54 arc seconds and my seeing is represented, is telling me how big my stars are. Stars are point sources. It's the best way to tell how sharp of an image you're going to get of any deep sky object as well. So the question is, and this is a very contentious question, you'll get into lots of fights on cloudy nights uh, from people who did not get A's in math, about how to do proper sampling. How many pixels do you need to represent the smallest features very well? Uh, I have a great example I like to use. This is the moon with a camel with very large pixels. And we call this undersampled. Uh, obviously, this does not look like the moon. All of the light from the moon concentrated into one pixel just gives you a big white square and nothing anywhere else. So this is a really good example. Undersample does not give you a very detailed image. You get a big blocky image. And what you want is a well-sampled image, uh, lots of pixels to represent the details on the moon or on any object. Uh, that you want to take a photo of. And of course, if you're zooming in on craters and so forth, you want more and more pixels so that you can get more and more detail. However, there is a problem. You can have too many pixels and that's called oversampling. And oversampling will make a mushy mess. You can only magnify an object in the sky so much. Uh, and there are two things, uh, there, are, there are two limits as to how much you can oversample, how much you can magnify something. Uh, they are the diffraction effects of your optics, and they are the atmospheric seeing of, well, obviously the atmosphere. Now, the good news is most telescopes today are actually already diffraction limited. Um, my, my amateur astronomy career is long enough that I remember when Diffraction limited optics, diffraction limited optics. Ooh, I got to get me some of that diffraction limited optics. Uh, the truth is most stuff today is already diffraction limited. If it's not, you definitely don't want to buy it. Uh, but most things uh, are. But on Earth, the seeing is always the limit. Uh, you, you know, the, the atmosphere is going to move things around. Remember, like trying to take a photo of an object at, at the bottom of a swimming pool. The air is moving around. So the seeing is going to determine the size and the smallest details you can capture in all practical purposes. This is not to say that you can't get better and better quality optics. If you bought a $10,000 refractor uh, under really good seeing conditions, you can probably tell the difference. Most nights, you can't tell the difference. You can tell the difference because you think it, you, there should be a difference because you spent a lot of money on it. Uh, but you need really good seeing uh, in order to uh, in order to tell the difference, uh, and and that's you know that's the case. Fortunately, here in Florida, my fellow Floridians, we do get a lot of good nights of very good seeing, and you can walk around to see for star party and look through del different telescopes, and you can probably tell the difference uh, in the price tag and in the quality uh, of the optics. Uh, let's see. So how big are your stars in arc seconds? And of course, how many pixels are used to sample the star? So um, a lot of times people will bring up sampling theory, the Nyquist-Shannon sampling theory. I was fortunate. I had a whole class in college on this, not really on this, but it was on signals and networking. Uh, so I knew about this before I started doing astrophotography. And uh, if you ask me, the guy on the bottom, that's uh, Shannon. He kind of looks like a villain. Poor guy. Um, but the, listen, make sure you, never mind, I should stop. Um, what it tells you is the minimum sampling needed when converting analog signals to digital signals. So the light coming into your telescope is an analog signal, and it's a two-dimensional signal, and you want to convert it into digital. And how do you do a, how do you sample that well? Um, if you've ever had a really bad phone call uh, where there was a lot of, the person sounded really horrible, sometimes that's because uh, network problems and there's not enough sampling uh, on the signal. Uh, people will toss around this. 2x greater uh, is critically sampled. However, if you actually read the theory, it says it needs to be more than 2x if the signal is sinusoidal, which for the people who did not get A's in math, which is a lot of us, uh, basically means round stuff. 
and stars are round. Uh, so I break with a lot of people and I will say, um, you know, you need about 3x actually uh, is what I call critically sampling. And I'll, I'll talk more about that in a minute. Uh, say you're seeing is three arc seconds, then, you know, 1.5 to one arc seconds per pixel is about the best sampling you can do. If your pixels are even smaller, uh, you're oversample. You could perhaps bin, which sums up for adjacent pixels. So it kind of gives you, it kind of pretends to be a larger pixel camera. Or just when you get it into Photoshop or Pixel Site or whatever uh, you're using, just kind of shrink the image a little bit and you'll find it looks a little bit better uh, when you when you sample it down. Um, anything smaller, of course, also does not help uh, with the signal to noise ratio. Uh, which is uh, you get you tend you don't get a lot of signal per pixel, which means um, noise is more of a factor. We'll talk more about signal to noise in a few minutes. So my corollary to the Nyquist uh, sampling, that's right, Richard's corollary, is uh, very simple and easy to understand. Um, what is the minimum number of pixels required to make something look round? And I think this is very intuitive. Uh, if you have a round star that's smaller than a pixel, because um, you know, your, your sampling is, is uh, you know, really high, uh, you know, stars are going to look like squares. I had a guy argue with me once on a forum. He's like, I've never seen scars that look like squares. You don't know what you're talking about. And I wanted to say, well, I have lots of images with square stars. I'm pretty sure I know what I'm talking about. Um, he lived in an area with very bad seeing all the time, and he his stars were you know, he's jumping around. And so no matter what optic he used, he'd never been oversampled in his life, obviously. And since you've never been oversampled in your life, obviously nobody else ever is, right? Um, but, you know, 2x also isn't really enough. Uh, 2x, uh, you can just get a larger square if, if your star is right in the center of those four. But if you've got at least a three by three cell, things that are round can start to kind of look like they're round, assuming you're well sampled, of course. Uh, if the star is very tiny, it's still going to be one little thing there. But uh, if you're well sampled, about a three by three cell on a round object is going to make something look, um, it's going to make something look very round. So what are the best practices around this now that you have these this new information about seeing and what it means? Know your seeing conditions. Uh, if you're if you're out west, they have beautifully transparent skies and beautiful mountains to take nightscapes with the Milky Way and constellations rising behind them. And the wind flows right over those mountains. And it's like uh, I was talking about a swimming pool. Imagine a hot tub or a jacuzzi. Uh, that wind is moving the air around a lot. Uh, if you're in a nice big open area and the, and the air moves smoothly over it, like on an island or in Florida, most of Florida, you might have really good seeing. And so it can, it can also vary uh, throughout the year. So pair your optic and camera to optimize uh, your sampling. Uh, slightly more than two pixels over the seeing limit, I would I would say. So, you know, if you're buying a camera, what kind of telescope are you going to put it on? You figure out your pixel scale and make sure um, you have a good you have a good match for that. Uh, if you are undersampled, um, you know, you will get a better signal to noise ratio. You, you, I mean, uh, I, most nightscapes are really dramatically oversampled, and that's fine. That's why you can do a nightscape with a beautiful uh, Milky Way with a single shot. You don't have to, you don't have to stack a whole bunch of images for hours uh, to pull that stuff out. Um, dithering will help round out uh, square stars. I have some slides on what dithering is late later uh, for the anxious. I'll just tell you that um, dithering is basically moving the sensor and the the optic around a little bit between exposures. If you're oversampled, uh, don't oversample if you can avoid it. Um, you can oversample though for lucky imaging uh, bright tar targets on the moon and the planets and the sun. Sometimes you can do you can get very nice images at a tenth of an arc second per pixel, uh, which is very very tiny. Um, and the Hubble Space Telescope can get a tenth of an arc second per pixel. Uh, but trying to do deep space stuff at a tenth of an arc second per pixel is madness. Uh, it's not going. It's not going to work. Uh, you may be, you know, quite sure uh, because it looked good on the screen. But when you when you zoom in and look at it, it's just going to be um, a fuzzy mess. And of course, if you get that, you can just shrink it, uh, and that will often that will often help. All right, hang on just a second. Um, 
I tend to wiggle around a lot and I get wrapped up in my cord and I'm going to unplug myself. <laughs> I'm not careful. All right. I promise to talk about dithering. I have a little animation. Let's see if it works. There you go. You see how the stars are moving back and forth? That's dithering. Each exposure, you've moved the stars just a little bit. Uh, most people dither, uh, they're doing auto guiding. I did have somebody, again, uh, somebody uh, want to debate me. You can't dither if you're not auto guiding. Sure, you can. Uh, if you have scripted imaging, I dither all the time with the sky uh, without guiding. All dithering, dithering isn't a guiding thing. It just simply means move, move the stars around each frame. So there's noise in this image, these little dark areas and things like that. Some of that noise is pattern noise from your camera. Um, and if you move that around from frame to frame, when you align these later and combine them, uh, it helps get rid of that. Uh, it helps smooth that noise out. Also, if you have blocky stars and you move just a few pixels between exposure, when you realign and you stack that, it will have a tendency a lot of times to round out those blocky stars. Uh, so that's uh, that's a nice thing uh, for if you're a little oversampled. So stars and image things move, hot pixels move around. Um, and... Um, yeah, so when you align uh, later and you do your processing, um, it gets rid of it gets rid of all of that. Another best practice is stack with rejection. Uh, this is a an Orion Nebula shot uh, that I that I shot um, one time a couple of years back. Uh, the image on the left is a rejection map. Uh, everybody's complaining about Starlink satellites and. Uh, uh, airplane, I'd like, I actually, uh, I'll do a lot of my imaging in Okeechobee and the, the Miami airport likes to fly right freaking over my field. Um, as I airplanes flying through my, my images all the time. In fact, uh, this is an airplane right here. Um, you get these two stripes right next to each other. That's another airplane. This is an airplane and these little two bright areas are where the strobes went off. Um, but you'll you'll take many of these images and combine them, and you can your your post processing software can uh, do a statistical rejection. In other words, it goes all these images, only one has these bright lines through it. I'm going to get rid of it. Only one has these bright lines through it. I'm going to get rid of it. Only one has this bright line through it. I'm going to get rid of it. You see all these up and down. I don't know if you can see it over the internet if the compression works, but there's some fainter lines going up and down. Um, and I'm, I know this from experience, uh, but these are, uh, these are, th those are satellites. Um, Orion is infamous for satellites, the geosynchronous satellite belt, uh, those things that make your GPS work and your, and your phones and all that sort of thing. Uh, all of those geosynchronous satellites go right through Orion and they go, they roll right over M42. Uh, in fact, I, I had a friend at a star party come over once. He goes, I got, this, I got this new camera and I've got all these stripes up and down. And I looked at it and I said, those are satellites. And he says, you said, I've never seen them before. And I said, well, you got a better camera, didn't you? Uh, and now, <laughs> and now, you, now they're showing up. Uh, but stack with rejection and it will get rid of those uh, when you stack. I know stack is a buzzword. I can't explain everything at once. I will talk about stacking, stacking too. But suffice it to say, we take lots of images and we combine them. And the buzzword for that is stack. And when we combine them, the computer can find artifacts that are only in one of the frames and can toss them out for us uh, and get rid of it. So let's talk about uh, signal and noise. Um, the amount of signal and noise is really one of the biggest bit, biggest differences between uh, these two images, uh, for example, uh, the one on the um, the one on the left is one of my very, 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 very first deep sky images, single exposure of um, M13 taken at the Winter Star Party. The one on the right is a much more recent version of M13, uh, and the one on the left was uh, like a single exposure with like a need deep space imager or something like that. Got one exposure and it's very noisy. The image on the uh, on the right, lots of exposures combined. And we, the reason we combine lots of exposures is to get the noise down. A common misconception is we take lots of exposures to make the image bright. No, we can make the image bright all we want in post-processing. 
But if the image is noisy, then we get a bright noisy image. So we got to get the noise down uh, or at least the ratio of the, of the pretty image we want to the noise to such a level that we can brighten it uh, so that um, so that it's a nice, clean, pretty image. Yes, you have to process these. Uh, none of these are visible to the naked eye. Um, I'm not going to go off on my soapbox about what does something you can't actually see really look like. Um, not going to go there. Now, there are five manageable noise sources in astrophotography. Um, most people don't know that there are more than one noise source. Most people lump them all together. Uh, and knowing the difference between them will help you uh, process your images better. I will help you get better data if you understand where the noise is coming from. The first is called dark fixed pattern noise. And um, often we'll shoot a bias frame to calibrate that out, which will remove the dark fixed pattern noise. Those are uh, in a blank image with the shutter covered. You get you see these streaks and bars and things all through the image. That is dark fixed pattern noise. Um, there's also dark current. Uh, we take darks to try to get rid of um, uh, the dark pattern noise from that, uh, the dark current noise uh, from that. Uh, shot noise. Uh, shot noise is 100% independent of your camera and your optic. It is simply a matter of how much signal do you get or how much light is getting to your sensor. I've got a really great diagram or animation to show what how, how that works. Another is read noise, your electronic camera, uh, just converting uh, photons from a distant source into electronic signals. Uh, introduces some noise from the electronic process. Uh, and so that adds noise to your image as well. And then there's something called PRNU, which is a really fancy word, photo response non-uniformity. And we try to fix that with flat frames. Um, so let's talk about dark fixed pattern noise. This is noise from the sensor. It's always there. I don't know if you can see this on your uh, internet uh, on the Zoom as much as you could on a on a big projector, but there's a whole bunch of lines going up and down here, uh, and you can there's just you know there's this pattern of lines up and down, and that's going to be in your image. All your images of the Horsehead Nebula are going to have this you know blind this this line set of lines going up and down. Uh, so uh, we usually call this the bias signal. Uh, sometimes they crisscross, or there's patterns or stripes. Uh, cheap CMOS cameras, thankfully this, the CMOS cameras have come a long way, even since I gave this talk a few, uh, few years back. Uh, but still, some of the cheaper CMOS cameras, um, the dark pattern noise dances around and you can't calibrate it out. And for a long time, this is one of the things where CCD is still better than CMOS. And it was because of uh, this type of noise. Uh, the newer, a little more pricier CMOS cameras don't have this problem anymore. And so I can't beat that drum. Uh, to get rid of it, we subtract a bias or a dark frame. So we're going to take some images with the telescope covered, uh, and we'll use that in our processing later to calibrate that out. Calibrate might be a 50 cent word for you, but uh, it just basically means fix it. So we're, you know, it will fix this pattern in your images uh, by doing a, a dark or a bias uh, bias frame. Uh, dark current is thermally induced. Uh, basically, just the temperature will induce signal in the image sensor, which will show up as hot pixels, uh, bright columns. Uh, so the columns are, could be trap leaks or other things, defects in the sensor as well, but we kind of lump it in together because they calibrate out uh, the same way. They can also be uh, fixed uh, by subtracting a dark frame, which is again, is a frame with the telescope covered. So if you take a five minute exposure of an object, uh, like the Orion Nebula or something, you wanna take a five minute exposure with the telescope capped, and that'll give you a dark frame uh, that will help clean that up. You need to make sure they're at the same temperature and length. Uh, don't try to use short dark frames. You can do it. Some software will let you stretch your dark frames. That is not a best practice, boys and girls. Uh, that usually works good enough, but it is not definitely not a, uh, a best practice. Now, bonus, um, dark frames contain the bias as well as the dark current. So if you do darks, you do not need to do bias frames. A, a good dark will, can, will calibrate or fix both of those. Um, now the, the dark current has its own shot noise as well. So that temperature is, that, that signal 
you get from the dark current rises with time uh, and can add noise to your image. Now, another really nice thing about the latest generation of sensors um, in the last couple of years is they have very, very, very low dark current. So if you cool your camera, a lot of sensors, you can just shoot a bunch of biases and not worry about dark frames. Uh, your mileage may vary, depends on the camera and depends on the temperature. Or I should say depends on the sensor and depends on the temperature. Um, a CCD that I really like, the 694 from Sony, um, uh, vendor gave me a camera and I'm like, there's no way. He's like, you don't need to do dark. So I'm like, I don't believe you. And I tested it. I went up to 20 minute exposures and the dark current is just, it's practically not there. Uh, also on the, the newer CMOS cameras, the dark current is so low that it, as long as you cool it, you don't want to shoot it you know, on a 90 degree night. Uh, but if you, if you cool the camera, the dark current is is either not measurable or it's negligible. And you can, you can just do uh, bias frames. So, um, let's talk about shot noise for more. Uh, all signals, uh, all, all sources of light have shot noise. Uh, shot noise is like this graininess you see in this image. So this is the, um, the Andromeda galaxy. The core of the Andromeda galaxy is pretty bright. Right in the middle near that bright spot, um, it's a pretty smooth image. But the further we get out from the middle, the more noise there is. And this noise, uh, shot noise is not camera, this, this kind of speckling can show up from sensor noise, from being hot. It can show up from read noise, but I'm not talking about those noise sources. This is shot noise. This is the fact that it's a very dim object and you're not getting a lot of light from it. Uh, imagine the photons of light coming from this source being rain. And it's, a, it's not Hurricane Ian rain. It's a very, just a little drizzle here and there. And so you get a photon here and a photon there and a photon there. And you add all that up over the course of your exposure. And you get a noise with, you get an image with a lot of holes in it because it's not really nice and wet. Uh, it's just kind of a very sprinkling. And if we expose a little bit longer, we collect more photons and the image smooths out. And the more photons we get, the more light we get, the better exposed our image, the cleaner and cleaner that image becomes as it accumulates. And as um, in, in traditional photography, we talk about exposure. A well-exposed image is bright. Well, also a well exposed image, a well exposed image is also very clean and very noise free. And fortunately, you know, this isn't a birthday party or a wedding. We have to expose for a really long time to get a well exposed image, or we have to accumulate a lot of short exposures and combine them to effectively get um, a longer exposure image. And the longer we expose, the more signal accumulates. And the longer we expose, the more noise also accumulates. What? So this is, okay, this is a bit of a stumbling block uh, in the garden. So the longer you expose, the noisier it gets. Mm, not quite. Shot noise has a really cool um, relationship to our signal. Yes, both the signal and the noise go up, but the uh, signal goes up faster than the noise, uh, which is really great. The noise tags along at the square root. I mean, of the, this is wrong. I'm going to fix this right now. Signal. There we go. There. Noise tags along at the square root of the signal. So you can see over here, your signal is getting stronger and stronger the longer you expose, and the noise is going up much slower. So when the signal is really high compared to the noise, we call that a very high signal to noise ratio. And a high signal to noise ratio gives you a nice clean image. Down here, where the signal and the noise are close together, you're going to get a very noisy image. Way down here, you're going to have more noise and signal. Uh, and it's just, it's a, you're not going to be able to see anything in the, in the image at all because it's going to be too noisy. Now, a very common mistake uh, let me get to the next slide, the next thing here. This is called the signal to noise ratio. A very common mistake when, when interpreting this graph or a similar one where they show signal noise is to go, well, this is the, 
the number of minutes that I've exposed, or this is the number of exposures. And after 16 exposures, there's no more difference in signal to noise ratio, or, or after 16 minutes, there's no, no, this is signal. This is how much light do you get from the target. And this can vary through the frame. If you're shooting a very dim target, you may have to shoot a long time to get a lot of signal. If it's a very bright target, it's the moon, I'm going to get a lot of signal, very short exposure, I'm going to get a lot of signal. A very faint nebula, I've got to shoot a long time to get a lot of signal. So this has nothing to do with exposure time or the number of exposures that we're tracking. This is only to do with how much light we're getting, how much light have we collected from the target in total. And that's a very important um, nuance, I guess, to understanding how to get the best uh, the, the, the best results. And like I said, it'll vary across the frame. I can do a, a five minute exposure of the Andromeda galaxy. And at the core of the Andromeda galaxy, there's a lot of signal and it's going to be very smooth. But as I get away from the core and I get out to the arms where those uh, globular clusters and star forming areas are that are really cool, uh, in a single five minute exposure, I don't have very much exposure, I don't have very much signal at all. And I'm down here and the noise is very noticeable and I, and I want to clean that image up. So I'm going to have to take lots of exposures of Andromeda because the core is fine. I can do that in one exposure. I'm done. But if I, I might have to expose an hour or two to get those faint arms to where there's enough signal collected in those faint arms to get a nice clean image of, uh, of my target. <clears throat> now, dark current noise. For those who have uh, <coughs> still have a CCD, uh, well, it depends on which CCD, but if you have a CCD or a a CMOS that does have significant dark current noise. I want to show you a graph uh, to show how what a difference, or not a graph, but an example of um, of what you get here. I, I hear a lot of times subtracting the dark removes the dark noise. Um, no, uh, not really. Uh, that's a rule of thumb. That's a simplification. Uh, you can calibrate out the dark noise pattern, but it doesn't really get rid of the dark noise. Uh, the only way to get rid of noise from dark current is to take lots of exposures because dark current noise is basically shot noise. Now the pattern from the dark current will get subtracted out, but that shot noise from the dark current will not. Here's an example of um, an, an image I took uh, at the Winter Star Party. I forgot, let me get all the slide, all the little text up here. Um, I had forgot to turn the cooler on on the camera, and I took a five-minute hydrogen alpha exposure of the, um, this is the Seagull Nebula, uh, and I'm like, ah, this looks terrible. What happened? Oh, I forgot to turn the cooler on. Why isn't that checkbox on by default? So I turned the cooler on. I cooled the camera off. I took another five-minute exposure, and I'm like, I'm keeping these two images because this is a great example. This noise is from an uncooled camera. You can't, no, you cannot take enough dark frames to subtract this noise and make it look like this. Uh, you have got to take hundreds of images like this at uncooled to get this one cooled image, which if you've learned nothing else from this, if you can cool your camera, you probably should. Uh, even on the newer sensors that have very little dark current, they do have, um, noticeable dark current at ambient temperatures, especially, uh, well, just, you know, especially in Florida, you know, your camera can get quite warm. Um, I won't even bother shooting with a DSLR on a telescope in Florida in the summertime. Now, when we get those nice cold nights in the wintertime, uh, I might pop it on there, but I have a cool one-shot color camera that I'll use um, because the DSLR gets hot and uh, it's very hard to get a good, it's very hard to get a good image when you have a hot uh, camera. Uh, I did the math on this. It's in my notes here. Um, the difference between these two, uh, the dark current noise here, you would have to take 512 of these, uh, 42 hours. So the cooling the camera saved 42 hours of exposure time to get an image with this little amount of, um, of dark shot noise. So that is, um, that's, that, that's substantial. Uh, another example, uh, even with a very fast uh, optic, I was shooting an F3 on uh, on one of my telescopes. Uh, DS, uncooled DSLR, 
uh, modified HA image uh, next to a cooled uh, uh, camera, single 20 minute exposure. Um, quite happy that I, you know I could go 20 minutes. Uh, but um, you can see the difference here. The the image on the right, uh, you know, I I could be done. You know, I could maybe a little more contrast or something to that. And, but that's a really good sub exposure. That's the Pelican Nebula. If you're wondering what it is, uh, but there's a lot of noise in this that is simply from the temperature of the sensor. So the way we drive down shot noise other than dark current shot noise is we take lots of exposures uh we you can't expose for three hours a single exposure of three hours uh your camera will overexpose and you'll have a, just a big white square and you won't be able to do anything with it uh much less if uh, you know planes flying by and birds and raccoons and things like that will happen uh, you may end up you know throwing away the whole exposure so we take lots of pictures and we stack them uh here's an image um single two minute image and here's like 60 two minute images uh, and you can see there's even details that you can't hardly make in this one exposure that pop out and this exposure and i've done minimal processing on this just so you can see you know how much smoother the stacked images so, you know, one exposure, two minutes, 60, 60 exposures at two minutes. And we'll use, uh, you know, our post-processing software will do that for us. So Pix and Sight, you can even do it with Photoshop. There's some tutorials on how to do it with Photoshop, but I would recommend you use Pix and Sight or Astro Pixel Processor, Deep Sky Stacker. There's lots of uh, things that, that will do that for you. A single long exposure, of course, is not practical for lots of reasons. And of course, the more images you take, the more signal you're going to collect. And uh, here's a picture about what I was talking about with the uh, with um, say Andromeda. You know, here in the middle, it's very bright, and just a few exposures, I got lots of signal, and lots of signal is a nice clean image. Out here at the edge, it's not nearly so bright, and so it doesn't matter how many exposures I take. I, I mean, it, each each exposure adds to the light, but the physics, what's actually going on? is how much light do I did I collect? And here I collected a lot of light, and here I only collected a little bit of light. So it's all about the signal, not the number of frames, not the number of minutes. Obviously, the signal goes up with the number of frames, and the signal goes up with the number of minutes. But it depends on the target that you're shooting, not the number of frames by itself, not just the number of minutes. Um, I'm serious. It's about the signal. So stack as many images as you can. And you will be uh, you will be golden. Well, hang on a minute. Um, if I can just take a whole bunch of short exposures, how short can my exposures be? If you calibrate, as in correct your images with uh, you know the with biases or flat frames and so forth, um, theoretically uh, the, sh the exposure length can be infinitesimally small, meaning like almost a zero of a second, theoretically. Um, the thing that limits us is the read noise of our camera, aside from the fact that your hard drive may fill up with, you know, millions of, you know, half second exposures. Uh, the read noise on your camera is fixed. Um, it's random. Uh, every image is going to have it. And it doesn't matter how long you expose, uh, you get the same amount of read noise. And to stack, you can stack out read noise, but it takes a lot of images to stack out and get rid of uh, get rid of your read noise. So the best practice is get your signal above the read noise. Expose long enough um, so that you're um, you're up and out of the read noise. And once you're up and out, once the faintest thing you want to capture in the frame, like I said, if you're shooting uh, if you're shooting a galaxy and you want to catch those star streamers off to the side. Uh, the galaxy may show up, you know, in a 10 second exposure, but those star streamers to get them up over the read noise, you may need to expose for a minute or two or three. And once you can do, once you get above the read noise, um, then you can actually, you can stop and just stack more of the, more of the frames uh, together. So yeah, pretty much I've said all of that. Uh, faintest feature you want to capture, if it's lost in the background noise. Um, this is also why light pollution, uh, light polluted skies need so much more integration time. Um, the light from the light pollution uh, also adds noise. Um, not only the light, if it was if it, if light pollution had no noise, it would just be a simple offset, and you could fix that with one swipe of the uh, 
uh, you know, the histogram slider bar on, on whatever tool you're using. But that signal from the noise is also speckled, and those speckles get added to your image. And so you do get an offset, but the speckling remains in your image, and you have to take a lot more images. Um, I don't remember the math, but it, it's like, it's almost it's almost 10 times the exposure time under a light polluted sky uh, as under a dark under a dark sky to get rid of the noise you know efficient effectively uh, from the light pollution uh, of course we have light pollution filters now people can do all sorts of things to help uh, filter out um, so again yeah there's no online calculator that's going to do this for you it depends on whether you know there's a there's a ball game at the high school stadium nearby, or if the if the humidity is kind of high and the light gets scattered around a lot more. Um, so, you know, you have to take a few sample exposures, look at them, and kind of be able to judge. This is, you know, at a certain point, it's kind of like making it's like kind of like being a chef or a cook. Um, we all start in the same place, you know, microwave meals. Um, Marie Calendar pot pies. You know, take the foil off, stick it in the oven, put it in for thirty minutes. If you and that's fine, and you can just eat pot pies for the rest of your life, and I might even be okay with that. But if you want to do some fancy stuff and you want to really push the uh, push the envelope, uh, you're going to have to, you know, take some images, evaluate them, take a look, see see where your noise threshold is, and then take a lot more. People a lot of times like to challenge me uh, on this. Uh, you can't get away with short exposures. Yes, you can. Uh, if you're over the read noise, here's some example shots. This is. Um, uh, 15, this is an hour of 15 second exposures uh, on the Andromeda Galaxy. Here's an hour of 15 second exposures um, on M33. Uh, it doesn't always work though. Uh, here's an example, one five minute exposure, oh, five one minute exposures versus one five minute exposure. Uh, obviously they're different. Why? Um, it had to do with the camera and it has to do with the fact that this is a narrow band image. This is a hydrogen alpha image shot at F7 and the faint details were not higher than the read noise of the camera. So it did not work. Uh, and so, yeah, there is, there is a limit to that. Now, just sort of a little bit of uh, prognostication, if you will. The read noise on cameras is plummeting. Uh, last couple of generations of sensors uh, read noise has been going down. The read noise on CMOS, um, the CMOS camera manufacturers really like to talk about how the read noise is really low. Um, but there is another factor to short exposures, and that's the dark pattern noise. And although the read noise on the CMOS was very low, uh, the dark pattern noise on CMOS was actually really bad, um, and it would move around. And so unlike a CCD, you couldn't calibrate it out or you couldn't fix it. And so despite the fact that the read noise on the CMOS sensors was low, you really couldn't get top-notch images with short exposures. That is not the case today uh, with some of the newer sensors. Um, you know, and it doesn't have to be like a fourth, you know, real expensive one, like the 533, uh, for example, also has uh, very controllable dark pattern noise and very low read noise. And so, you know, for a thousand dollars, you uh, maybe a little more than that, you can get a cooled CMOS with low pattern noise and low read noise, and um, and you can you can do quote top notch images. You can go pretty deep on a target as long as you're willing to take lots of uh, lots of sub exposures. Uh, a final form of noise that often gets overlooked: uh, photo response non non uniformity (PRNU). Um, and what this is caused by is two things. Pixels don't always get the exact same amount of light. And also all the pixels on a sensor do not respond uniformly uh, to the light identically. So even if you have a really well exposed image and the photons are well distributed, you still get a, a, a bit of noise from the, the sensor response. This is often neglected because it gets lumped in with vignetting, which you can see on this image up here. And it's very easy to fix vignetting uh, with image processing software. Uh, you can just say, yeah, okay, brighten the edges and make it circular and you can get rid of vignetting. And that works great on, um, it works great on daylight photos where you've got a little vignetting and it works really great on nightscape photos where you've got a little vignetting. Uh, and you can use it on a deep sky photo if there's a little galaxy in the middle and you don't care about what's out toward the edges. Uh, it also works great. Um, but it does remove a significant amount of 
this speckling going on. Also, uh, if you've got these little donuts, um, this is like my favorite. Hey, Richard, can you look at my pictures? There's something wrong with my camera. And they've got these little donuts. There's nothing wrong with your camera. This is just little motes of dust on your sensor cover or on the filter wheel cover. Uh, these, these, by the way, this, these little dust motes are not on your object. They're not on your mirror. They're not on the front of your telescope. Things on your mirror or on the front of your telescope are so out of focus, you can't see them. They degrade the overall brightness and contrast of your image and very, very, very um, uh, negligibly, negligibly until it really starts to pile up. But dust and things closer to the sensor will leave these little marks and things. And you can calibrate them out, aka fix them by taking a, a flat calibration image. Uh, one more shot, one more, one more little couple things about uh, what this looks like. Uh, this is uh, an example of why you would want to correct this noise out. This is a uh, speckling you get from this PRNU, uh, and you get a lot of the speckling with the bright signal. And of course, guess where we get a lot of bright signal uh, from light pollution. So light pollution will add some of the speckling to your image. And if you calibrate it out, it makes a big difference. You can really see, uh, you can really see the difference. So. Uh, one more slide to show light pollution. Dithering can help with that. Um, so the way we fix this uh, or we calibrate this is by taking a flat field image. Uh, you know, here's an image with you know of of that's in thirteen again, isn't it? Um, with some circles on it, a little bit of shadow up here from my uh, uh, my off axis guider was sticking down too much. And so here's what the flat looks like. It's got these circles. And you can see these donuts or dust bunnies uh, in this image above it. In this image, all the dust bunnies are gone. I still get a little bit of uh, drop off up here at the top. And it's good to tell, it's a, it's, a, it's a useful thing to tell people that flat filling isn't always perfect. Uh, it can't completely correct things um, you know, that are really severe. This is a shadow from something in my optical path. And you can't just make a shadow go away. There's light that's not there. Uh, and so I'm going to definitely lose some signal up here uh, at the very top. But all my dust bunnies are gone. Uh, you know, I corrected those uh, very well. How do you make an image that looks like this um, so that you can calibrate it out with your, with your post-processing software? There's a couple of ways. You can use a flat panel. Uh, which are these like little boxes that glow, you plug them in, you put them on top of the telescope and they uniformly light your, uh, light your sensor. Uh, you can, I use an iPad actually at night occasionally if my uh, telescope is small enough. Uh, during the day, uh, an old, hopefully not a used hanky, a t-shirt or a towel or something that's white uh, can go over. There's little wrinkles here. Oh my gosh, it's not, yeah, these are gonna be so out of focus. As long as these aren't too bad, it's going to be fine. Um, expose, uh, try to make your, I'm going to kind of rush through this a little bit, but kind of make your histogram about in the middle to two thirds of the way up uh, is a good place uh, to do it. There was a lot of brouhaha a couple of years ago about CMOS and flats. Uh, CMOS sensors, uh, weren't really linear. So the math didn't, that's a fancy word too, but the math didn't really work out right for a lot of CMOS sensors. Um, and I'm happy to say that also is no longer the case. The talk I used to give is why CCD is still better than CMOS. And I, I can't give that talk anymore because um, none of the points I made are true anymore. And I remember when I gave the talk saying, this is not gonna be true forever. In a few years, I won't be able to give this talk. And I was right. So let's see, I think this slide is a duplicate. Uh, if you're doing uh, filters, a uh, monochrome sensor with um, uh, filters, you got to do one for each filter, which is a real pain in the butt. A lot of people like doing one shot color uh, because it does make the workflow a lot easier. Um, it is, um, yeah, I'll we'll just stop there. So best practices, uh, kind of some, some up here. Stack a ton of bias frames to reduce your read noise, uh, or just uh, um, or just use the bias. Actually, it's another typo. Stack a ton of dark frames. Um, or just uh, a bunch of biases as well. 
Um, you can just shoot darks. If you need darks, don't shoot darks and biases. And don't give your software darks and biases. Both uh, most software, including Pixel Sight, often does the wrong thing. Um, just give it, give it your darks or just give it uh, your biases if you don't need to shoot uh, darks. Uh, try to avoid subtracting just one dark. Uh, the dark frame has that shot noise in it. If you only have one dark and you've not stacked a bunch of them to reduce that dark current shot noise, if you subtract noise from an image, you actually make that image noisy. Uh, so you can actually make an image worse by subtracting just one dark. Um, now that presumes that your dark current pattern noise isn't so horrible, uh, you know, uh, that, that you just have to subtract at least something to, to get it. Make sure you expose above the read noise and uh, be sure and uh, stack your light frames and cool your den camera if you can. And don't forget flats. Another best practice, uh, darks are a pain in the butt. So make yourself a library of darks, um, especially if you have a cooled camera, you can just set it for cool, put it on your desk and you know cover it up. Don't cover up the fans, of course, but um, make sure no light's getting in. Take some five minute subs and some 10 minute subs and some two minute subs and stack them up and you'll have a whole library of darks so you don't have to reshoot your darks every time you go out and, and image. Um, you should refresh them about every six months or so. This is really wild, but true, I promise you, but there is such a thing as cosmic rays and uh, CCDs and CMOS sensors actually do degrade over time due to cosmic rays. So it's kind of like uh, too much sunlight can give you cancer. Well, cosmic rays can also knock things loose in your electronics and cause them to degrade uh, as well. And uh, you will find uh, sometimes you'll get differences in your darks uh, over time as your camera ages. Uh, you really have no excuse if you have a uh, temperature controlled camera not to shoot a dark library or at least to use darks uh, or, or, or biases. Uh, shot at the same temperature. And why don't you have a camera uh, with a tech? You should definitely do that. So, all right, I've talked for a long time. I'm feeling a little, how are we doing? We haven't lost a whole lot of people. I'm just going to kind of take a little bit of a break here. Did John Pinto show up? Yes. Hi, John. We were worried about you. All right, good. Well, I'll talk for, um, uh, like I said, there, I've got a lot of slides. This was a four hour workshop, so I'm not gonna go through everything. Let's go through, um, yeah, let's just talk about maybe one more topic, which would be really helpful for a lot of people, I think. And then, uh, then we'll call it a wrap. And maybe I can do part two later down the road or maybe as a workshop in the, at the December meeting or something. Um, another common question uh, is what ISO should I shoot at? Um, and uh, the rule of thumb is the higher the ISO, the more noisy your image is. And that is absolutely not true. It's not true. It's not true. It's not true. No matter how much you believe it, no matter how many National Geographic award-winning photographers have told you that raising the ISO increases the noise, um, it does not. We are going to we are going to talk about what's really going on. Um, actually, uh, lower ISO is actually noisier for low light, as it turns out. And the reason is shot noise. Um, remember all that talk I did about very little light giving you lots of shot noise and very grainy images? Less light produces more shot noise. And almost every photographer on the planet, if you think about it, astrophotography is a niche within a niche within a niche. And almost every photographer on the planet knows by heart the exposure triangle. Change the exposure, change the aperture, change the ISO in order to get a well-exposed image in the amount of time that you have. And if you've got a rapidly moving subject, you need a fast exposure and it might be noisy. And the reason it's noisy is you had to up the ISO to get a really bright image that you could, you know, for your JPEG or whatever. But what happens, you up the ISO, you get a shorter exposure, you get a noisier image. Why do you get a noisier image class? Because you had a shorter exposure, not because the ISO added electronic noise to your image. You got a noisier image because you shortened the exposure. Now, you can do a science or a project and prove this to yourself and go somewhere dark and take some photos and put your camera in, ma in manual mode and take a bunch of exposures and change the ISO, but do not change the aperture and do not change the exposure time. Take the exposures with the same aperture 
and the same exposure time and just change the ISO. And you'll see the images get dimmer with the lower ISO and the images get darker with the brighter ISO. But when you pull them into your photo editing software, when you brighten up the dark image and compare it to the bright image, they have exactly the same amount of noise. Um, here's uh, some examples I did for you. Uh, here's 10 seconds at f1.4 at ISO 100. You can do this in Adobe RAW or lots of other tools that let you change the exposure to brighten up the image. So holding them all the same, uh, here's ISO 100, here's ISO 200, here's ISO 400, here's ISO 800. Hopefully on your screens at home, you're seeing a difference here and the image just keeps getting cleaner and cleaner and cleaner. And if you can't see that, maybe this will help. Uh, so, right? Um, ISO 3200 is a lot less noise than ISO 100. Uh, you know, how is, the, how is that, how is that happening? Um, that's because the, uh, well, for a number of reasons, um, primarily it's the dark pattern noise I was telling you about earlier. Uh, if you have a very low ISO, the dark pattern noise is, um, is very prominent. And when you stretch the image, you see that dark pattern noise. Now, if you subtract a bias, it could help, but it's probably not because you can't really shoot. Um, it's very difficult to get good calibration frames out of a out of a out of a DSLR or an SLR or mirrorless uh, camera. So um, ISO is not equal to sensitivity. You do not make your camera more sensitive. All you're doing is digitally stretching the image. ISO in the film days, film was more sensitive. Um, uh, because it was a physical process and it would take less light to trigger those little crystals to do their little magic thing on the film grain. And uh, very sensitive film would be very grainy and very uh, least less sensitive film would be very fine grained. You'd get a smoother image because you got lots of light that shows up very easily. But ISO is emulating that. Uh, it's not actually making your sensor any more uh, any more sensor, any more uh, sensitive. Uh, so it's just doing a digital, it's just doing a digital stretch uh, of the image. So all cameras are not the same experiment, of course. Also, um, again, uh, a few years ago, and now I would say five years ago, 10 years ago, uh, I would say this is always the case. Upping the ISO is always going to give you a better image. On a lot of the newer cameras, I have a, have a EOS RA. If you have an EOS RA or a lot of the newer Nikons, a lot of the newer Sonys, all the ISOs, when you stretch them to the same brightness, they all look the same. There is no difference in ISO. Uh, the low ISO numbers are just as clean as the high ISO numbers. So you can take a photo uh, at any ISO you want, and just drive that, drag that brightness slider over uh, to brighten up the image, uh, and you'll get just as clean an image at almost uh, any ISO. Now, the RA is what we call ISO invariant, um, but I do find a difference between ISO 100 and 200. Uh, so even on the ISO invariant, there may be a little bit of a difference. And of course, best practice, don't look it up online, don't look for a table, take it out somewhere, take some pictures in the dark and look at them yourself and see what your gear uh, is capable of doing. Uh, you know, I used to tell people, uh, you know, when you, those those movies where you see the soldier putting together the gun, you know, blindfolded, um, uh, you know, it's practical. If you're a soldier, you might need to put together your gun or clean it in the dark. Because of course, if you turn the light on, you might get shot by the enemy. Uh, but it's the same thing in astrophotography. You need to learn how to use your camera in the dark. Um, most frustrating thing is a brand new camera with all the buttons in a different location. And, um, you know, you're out in the dark and you're trying, where's the button to magnify this on the viewfinder? Blah, blah, blah. Uh, learn to use it in the dark. You need to learn to use your equipment and um, how your equipment performs is the same way. What's it look like? Just make sure if you're comparing ISOs, you're comparing apples to apples, keep the aperture the same, keep the exposure time the same when you compare those ISOs. Otherwise, it is not a fair comparison uh, between the ISOs. Um, you are shooting deep sky objects, not winning photography. Um, all right, one last one. Don't shoot JPEG. Just, just don't. Don't shoot JPEG. Always shoot raw. Uh, all those little details in the dark areas of your photo, the JPEG is going to just destroy those or flatten them out, and you won't be able to process the image as well. And um, 
that's all I'm going to say. I've got about 30 slides left, and I'm going to do you a favor and not uh, go uh, on and on and on. But I hope that was helpful uh, for people. That was that's pretty much the. I, I hopefully that helped a lot of people, even if you're not doing um, deep space cooled camera, you know, thirty thousand dollars worth of gear. I think you know. I, I'm hoping that. Uh, a lot of this was, was helpful to understanding how the process worked. Or if you're thinking of getting into astrophotography, uh, it gave you some uh, some scaffolding to hang things on as you're poking around and starting to uh, do your own thing. So um, John Pinto has prepared a, I call it SUP, SUP tonight, John, and a review of the the. Royal Astronomical Society catalog. I'm going to let John take over from and finish the meeting, and then I'll I'll kind of close out with a few words. But John, are you ready to jump in? Uh, yes, Richard. Just tell me how much time I have. You can. Uh, well, it's quarter till. Um, don't talk for an hour. How about half half an hour? Yeah, half an sure. Hour. I think we can live through that. Okay. Yeah. Sounds yeah. good. Let me grab my uh, my slide deck here. I'm going to do it in a slightly different order than you had it listed because I think okay. we're going to do the observer's handbook first and then we'll end up with what's up. Okay, sounds great. All right, let me get this guy going. Okay, uh, the other question I had, Richard, do we know how much the observer handbook is going to cost a member if they would like to order it? Was it 27 this year? I think I, it was 27. I, I have not looked that up. Okay, I think it's 27 bucks. Um, and no shipping and handling, which is significant if you're actually ordering it yourself uh, from the folks up in Canada. So we, it's, a it's a great bargain if the you can get it through the club. It looks like Kent ordered 15 of them already. So Okay, great, great. And I think we just need to have people uh, post something in Groups.io to yeah. Kent, and that's basically how we, we order it. Yeah. And then I guess at the Christmas party, we'll hand them out when you bring a check or something. Okay, uh, the Observer's Handbook is a great tool for uh, pretty much everyone from beginner to advanced. It's got something for everyone. So I'm gonna just kind of give you a little quick preview of what uh, types of things are inside of it. And obviously I can't show you the whole thing, uh, but I'll give you a good sample of it. Uh, this was uh, the 2022 cover. I have no idea what the 2023 cover is going to look like. Hopefully, it's going to be a beautiful picture like this. Uh, they always uh, pick a nice uh, astrophoto for the cover. And that's the other thing. This slide deck has some uh, pages from 2021 handbook, some pages from 2022 handbook. So just don't take this as gospel for what we're going to see in 2023. Just wanted to give you an idea of the kind of data that's in here. This is a table of contents. Typically, it doesn't change very much. Um, they actually give you like little um, markers here to let you know uh, what it, Let me put my little pointer on here. Where's my arrow? Here we go. Here we go. They give you usually give you little markers as to whether it's a new section or just a revised section. So if you're very familiar with this year or year, sometimes you just go to the revised or new sections. Uh, some things for those of you into the math of it, um, we've got uh, all kinds of data that you can plug into your computer program uh, that change every year, uh, and just basic uh, information about the planet's uh, physical uh, parameters. Uh, I like this particular one because it has the um, calculations for figuring out where something is in the sky if you know its coordinates. Um, but it has a whole section of, of physical uh, constants and things like that, if you're into that. Uh, lots of information about time. Very interesting reading if uh, you don't even you know why we have like six different time scales. This is a great uh, little tutorial on that. Just by the way, if you understand this entire manual, you have a PhD in astronomy. So you don't think you have to understand everything. Just take take the things that you um, that you need, and leave the rest for another day. Uh, another good um, piece of information that I like to use here is uh, it gives you 
how to calculate sidereal time and your Julian date, which again comes in very handy when you're uh, doing any kind of astronomical calculation or just trying to figure out what's going to be up in the sky. Uh, the mean sidereal time is very handy for that. Uh, we've got um, so a twilight diagram, you know, how dark, when is it going to get dark? Uh, and it does it by our different latitudes. We're about 30, so we'll be somewhere in here and here. Uh, this table here is very uh, good summary of telescope parameters. Uh, and again, you can read this whole section and figure out, you know, what, how big of a scope do I have and what can I expect of, of the, uh, of the output from it, you know, how close of a uh, double star do I should I be able to get with my uh, 102 millimeter scope and things like that. This is sort of the heart of the book. Uh, this is the month by month guide of what's happening in the sky that month. So on the left hand side, um, it tells you about each of the planets and what's anything significant happening. Uh, gives you their location in the sky uh, over um, a couple of days of each during the month. And then on the right hand side, they highlight, you know, various things that are going on in the sky that you may be interested in. Um, I take a lot of what I do with what's up in the sky from this. Um, so it's uh, much more detailed than what I get into. The other cool thing it has here, and I only discovered this a little while ago, not this week, like about a year ago, these images of the moon are actually accurate. So if you hold this book at about arm's length, that's actually how big the moon is gonna look uh, to you. And it obviously shows you the different um, uh, places where the Terminator is uh, for that particular date. And where these little dots are shows you where the libration is in case you wanna catch a, uh, a crater that might be coming into view uh, on that particular day. It also obviously has eclipse diagrams. This is the eclipse diagram for the lunar uh, um, eclipse that's coming up, which I'll be talking about in my next talk. Maps of the moon, the ephemeris of the sun, if you wanna know where the sun is gonna be, if you wanna know equation of time, if you don't even know what I'm talking about, again, you can read this uh, uh, handbook and it'll teach you what that's all about. This is comets and it will show you that information. If you want to know how to pronounce a constellation's name, gives you all of that information. Some stars that you might be interested in, again, how you pronounce them. Some people will argue that Vega isn't really Vega, it's Vega. Don't believe them. You could say it whichever way you like. Uh, let's see, these are the brightest stars. Um, you probably, by the time you become, say, an intermediate astronomer, you should know what all of these are, at least the ones here in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, nearby stars uh, that are easily observable. Some people are interested in that. I know Barbara does a great job with Barnard Star every year. That's always fun to see. Uh, Wish I could move this out of the way. Let's see. Can I put that down there? Yeah, that's better. No, I can actually see what I'm talking about. Double stars, multiple stars, carbon stars, all things that uh, astronomers love to look at um, if you're into double stars or if you're into carbon stars. Carbon stars are great. They're usually have wonderful, you know, deep red or deep orange colors. Um, and a lot of them are variable as well. Uh, colored double stars, that's again, another favorite. And it, this one is broken up by the different seasons. Um, I know I love looking at uh, colored double stars, especially the blue and gold ones, like Alberio. Section on variable stars, especially long period variable stars. Uh, this past summer, we had a great uh, brightening of Myra, uh, which uh, some of us were observing, which was cool because we're probably not gonna see that for a few more years because it's next bright maxima is, we're not gonna be able to see it because it's gonna be during the day, but it'll be back. Here's a nice little 
collection of deep sky objects from the, some of the nearest ones to some of the uh, most furthest ones you can see with the amateur telescope. So that's kind of a cute um, personal certificate for yourself. Can you actually see how far into this list can you get and, and actually see some of it you can't and will have to be um, using astrophotography for, but a lot of these you'll be able to see. Whitefield Wonders is another beautiful list, especially if you have a um, fast uh, telescope, fast meaning uh, a low F number like F4, or F5, um, and you'll get a, usually you'll have a very large field of view. And these are the kinds of, of things that really make that type of telescope shine. If some of you are into radio astronomy, I know Alex is, um, this gives you another idea of something you can do with your radio telescope uh, bright uh, radio, cosmic radio sources. And the last thing I'm going to show you is some very simplified maps of the sky done by, um, by the months. Um, and again, just nice and handy if you're carrying your handbook around and you say, oh yeah, what was that up in September? Oh yeah, that's right, FOMO is, is down there. And we're going to be talking about that again in, in What's Up. And again, usually the back cover is another nice uh, astro image that they usually post up there. So I hope most of you will order this um, and make good use of it. I know some of our members have, have a collection of these from like decades ago. Um, and uh, they're just beautiful to have around and, and handy. So that's it for this year. And again, hopefully uh, we'll all see you at the uh, Christmas party and you'll be able to get your copy. All right, so that's that one. That was only 10 minutes, not too bad. Let me get my other one up. Okay, let's share this one. New share. Do this guy. Let's get him started. Okay, this is what I call my beginner program. Uh, so for you folks who are more advanced, this is probably uh, not going to be the most interesting talk. But I do love talking to you know new astronomers, people just getting into astronomy, and I like to uh, give them some orientation as to you know what you can do over the next month. Um, that will get you interested uh, in learning uh, the night sky. So I call it what's coming up in the night sky because I like to look, again, for beginners at what's coming up in the east part of the sky because it's much easier to see. Hopefully you can find some place where you have a nice eastern horizon and uh, the planets come up in the east. You get a preview of what's coming up in the following season. Uh, and we'll get into that as we get through some of these slides. Few things you should know if you don't know it already, the sky is huge, it's really big. And so some of the things that you look at, and if you see a little diagram that says, oh, you know, Orion is up in the sky. Well, how big is it? Is it this tiny little thing or is it really big? Um, so we try to use hand measures to give you some feel for how large things are. And this is a nice little, uh, a way you can, if somebody says, hey, you know, that's 15 degrees above the horizon or it's 20 degrees from one end to the other, um, this is a great way for you to, uh, to do that. And you can check yourself against the Big Dipper because it has some very nice um, dimensions to, uh, to check yourself. And you're gonna find out this is actually not too bad, pretty accurate. And we'll also be talking about directions. So, you know, Where's east? Because we are going to mainly be talking about what's up in the east. So um, find out where the sun comes up from your observing site, wherever you are that you want to follow along. Um, and we'll also be talking about some things that are in the northeast, the southeast, the south, the north, even in the west. So know where the sun comes up, know where the sun goes down, um, know where the sun is at uh, noon. And the opposite side will be where uh, north is. Obviously, you can take out its compass too, and it'll tell you the same thing. I like this particular site, what's out tonight. Um, 
for beginners. It's got lots of free information, it even has a little video tutorial on how to use these charts. And uh, we've had Ken, who uh, does this um, program, uh, this website, we've actually had him give us talks. So he's, he's a great, great, uh, interesting guy and uh, very much interested in helping beginners out. So you can go to this site, whatsouttonight.com, and you can print out a sky chart for the month that you're going to observe. And I'll tell you some of the you know interesting things that a beginner should be able to uh, pick out from the sky. And that's what we're going to be using uh, in this program. I also like to give you sort of a quick overview of what's going on in the solar system uh, so that it, you can visualize in your mind's eye why is Mars and Jupiter and Saturn where they are in the sky. So here's the Earth and here's the Sun. So anything over here is daytime. Okay, so you're not going to see anything that's over here. But if you can imagine uh, in the morning as the, uh, I'm sorry, in the, in the evening, um, the mercury is going to be pretty much visible for a little bit for the next couple of weeks. Right now, it's actually really visible um, in the, um, no, sorry, in the morning sky. This is the morning sky. Uh, it's going to be in the evening sky zone, but right now it's in the morning sky. Mars is in the evening sky. And Venus is, we can't see it because it's on the other side of the sun, but it will be coming around. We're going to see it soon. Now, over here, the Earth is about here and the sun's here. So opposite the sun. So this is the dark side. This is night. This is why Jupiter's here is in the sky. Saturn's a little bit over here. So Saturn's setting at night. Jupiter is you know, pretty much up all night long. And if you have a telescope, you're going to be able to see Uranus and Neptune in the evening. So just a quick top-down overview of where we are in the in the sky. And you're going to see that in our sky diagrams. All right, so about 8.15 in the evening is what this uh, diagram shows you. And again, we're going to mainly concentrate on the east. And in the east, the big thing that's coming up is the great square. Now, in the fall, I like to call it the great baseball diamond because that's what it looks like to me. Um, <clears throat> now, to my, I, uh, my talk about the size of things. So this on this little diagram looks tiny. But in the sky, this is about as large as your fist held up at arm's length. So if you hold your fist up and you put it up against the sky, that's about how big this great square is. Um, now, the other thing that you're going to notice is Jupiter's there. Jupiter's right underneath the great square. And Saturn's over here a little bit over to the right, pretty much in the south. Uh, things you might want to look at with your binoculars is the Andromeda galaxy is right over here. And we're going to be talking about Algol, the demon star. And where did he go? Ah, I went back. Sorry. Went ahead with myself. There's a demon star. We're going to be talking about when is a good night to see it. It's actually going to be near Halloween. So that's kind of cool. Um, this Perseus cluster is, is a beautiful cluster to see in binoculars. Straight over your head is going to be the summer triangle, even though we're in the fall. But you're going to have Vega, Deneb, and Altair. Great place to just take your binoculars out and just scan uh, for all kinds of star clusters and just beautiful patterns in the sky. Let's see. Uh, just, I don't think you're going to be able to see this, but it because we're kind of getting into the season where we're not going to be able to see the Big Dipper in the evening because we are uh pretty far south but if you do see the big dipper you use the pointers to find the north star in the morning sky around six in the morning again if you're up in the morning i like to get up in the morning because it's a lot clearer sometimes in the morning clouds uh, are have diminished so in the morning what we have is regular is uh, leo the lion and regulus the heart of the lion um, it's not shown on this diagram uh, because this is actually from March 2022. Uh, Ken hasn't put out the 2023 diagram yet, but in the morning, you typically want the diagram from a few months ahead. 
of the month that you're observing. I like to think of it as a preview. So even though we're technically in getting into uh, you know, between fall and winter, Leo is considered a spring constellation. So I think of it as we're taking a look at what we're gonna see in the spring uh, a little early. You're also gonna see uh, the great um, winter constellations uh, up in the morning. So you have Orion, Gemini, Canis Major, Canis Minor, uh, Origa, Taurus the Bull. Now people call this the winter hexagon. So I'll quickly go through what that is. So that's Rigel, Sirius, Procyon, Castor and Pollux, Capella, Aldebaran, back to Rigel, and Betelgeuse will be right in the middle. Some people also talk about a winter triangle. So that's Betelgeuse, Procyon, and, and Sirius. I'm um, sorry, Betel, Betelgeuse, Procyon, and Sirius makes a winter triangle. Now, again, what you don't see here is Mars. That's probably going to be the brightest thing next to Sirius in the sky. Uh, it, right now, Mars is right about here um, in uh, between in the horns of Taurus. But Mars is now going to do something called retrograde that's going to start around Halloween. And what's going to happen is uh, Mars normally has been moving along, chugging along, chugging along, chugging along towards the east. Well, in around Halloween, it's going to back up. It's going to go what they call retrograde. It's going to go back, 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 back. I forget how far back, probably near the Pleiades. Uh, and then at some point, probably in December, maybe in January, it's going to start moving back again. Now, this motion, this retrograde motion of Mars, fascinated and uh, frustrated the uh, ancients. They had no idea why it was doing that. We came up with all kinds of ideas. And it took Kepler to um, figure out his laws of motion of the planets, use, basically using the data that was collected on Mars and its retrogrades. And that's how he figured out the uh, Keplerian laws of motion of the, of the planets. Uh, let's see, anything else? A uh, couple other things that, that are nice to look at in binoculars. If you can pick out Coma Berenices, that's very pretty. The Pleiades, of course, is gorgeous. Um, the other thing that's really great to look in the binoculars is the Beehive Galaxy, the Beehive Cluster right here, M44. All great things. Now, one of the things I do like to say is that if you do this morning and evening uh, viewing of the sky, within six months, you will know the entire sky. Um, so, or you could do it just in the mornings and take a year or just in the evenings and take a year. But doing this, you'll learn the major constellations um, and uh, you'll see them every year at the same time. They don't change. The only thing that changes every year is where the planets are. All right, so what's coming up actually up in the sky? What are some of the events you may want to be interested in? Let's take a look. So tonight, I don't think we're gonna be able to see this because it's cloudy out or raining wherever you are, but the moon is, is very close to the Pleiades. And the reason we focus on the moon is because everybody can, everybody can find the moon, right? The moon's up, everybody knows where that is. But what that can do is teach us where certain things are in the sky that we may not be familiar with. Uh, so this is a great kind of like tour of the sky by using the moon. On Friday night, uh, the moon's gonna be near Mars. That's a little bit later in the evening, closer to midnight. Uh, Mars will be rising in the east. On the 17th is the last quarter moon and in the pre-dawn. So pre-dawn is like, like I'm saying between say six and, and seven o'clock in the morning. Um, the moon is gonna be near Pollux in the east and Mars will be between the tips of the horns of the Taurus the bull and that'll be pretty much overhead. So again, if you don't know where the horns of Taurus the bull are on Monday the 17th in the morning, go out there, look for Mars and you'll see two stars on either side, uh, probably about five degrees um, on either side of Mars, you'll find the Taurus the bull's horns. One horn's brighter than the other, just to, to warn you on that. On the 20th pre-dawn again, Mars is going to be five degrees from Regulus. Again, if you can't find Leo the lion and you don't know what star is Regulus, 
if you get up on the morning of the 20th before dawn, say around six o'clock in the morning, find the moon and Regulus will be that star that's about five degrees from the moon. On the 24th, again, we're a lot of morning stuff here. The moon's gonna be one degree from Mercury. Now this, I will tell you, you probably won't see unless you have a very clear east horizon with no obstructions and you have binoculars because the moon's gonna be very dim. It's gonna be a very thin crescent, you know, on paper thin crescent. Mercury is almost uh, gonna be lost in the glare of the sun, which is why you need the binoculars for both things. But between now and then, if you get up in the morning and look in the east around 645, the only bright thing near the horizon is gonna be Mercury, maybe about 10 degrees above the horizon. 25th is a new moon. Does it mean anything to us because we're not in Europe? If you wanna to go to Europe, you can. And they're gonna uh, experience a partial solar eclipse. Actually that so partial solar eclipse eclipse is going to not only go over Europe, but I believe parts of Africa, North Africa, Middle East, parts of Asia. Um, but again, for here in Florida, it's just the new moon. Good time to go out and, and observe a deep sky object since so the moon won't be uh, bothering uh, your visibility uh, for, for dim objects. Uh, Thursday the 27th, uh, as the sun, uh, just after the sun sets, the moon will be three degrees from Antares in the um, in the west, and that'll be in the constellation of Scorpio, Scorpius. And Sunday the 30th, remember I was mentioning to you about Algol, the demon star. That evening, it's going to have a minimum at 9.42 p.m. Now, the key to watching Algol is first to find it. So hopefully you can find it on, before you get to the 30th. This is probably not the evening to discover where Algol is. Find where Algol is and start watching it around eight. Um, and between eight and 9.42, you know, go out and look at it say every 10, 15 minutes and you'll see it visibly, you'll be able to tell it's getting dimmer and dimmer and dimmer up and through around 9.42. And then again, watch it for 15, every 15 minutes or so, you're gonna see that it brightens back up in a few hours. So it between say eight and 11, maybe 11.30, you're gonna, you'll see most of the full cycle of Algol at uh, its normal brightness, dimming down to its minimum, and then going back up to its normal brightness again. November, not too much going on in November before our next meeting. We have a first quarter moon, and at dusk, again, just after sunset, the moon will be about four and a half degrees from Saturn. So again, if you don't know where Saturn is in the sky, that's a good way to determine where it is. On the fourth, the moon will be near Jupiter in the evening. On the sixth, clocks fall back an hour. Hooray, standard time resumes. It's great for astronomers because it gets dark earlier. We don't have to stay up till midnight to get a nice dark sky. On the eighth in the pre-dawn, so again, around six, six-ish in the morning is when the full beaver's moon will be setting in the west and we will have a total lunar eclipse visible here in Florida. It begins at 4.09 a.m. It's when it just starts getting a little red. Totality will be at 5.16 a.m. They're definitely gonna mark your calendar for this and set your, set your alarm. Mid eclipse will be 5.59 or basically 6 a.m. And totality occurs at, uh, totality finishes at 6.42 a.m. And then the sun, the moon sets. So we're not gonna be able to see it come out of totality pretty much. So basically between five, quarter after five till about quarter to seven, um, get out there and watch a beautiful red lunar eclipse on November the 8th in the morning. Free internet resources. This is great, great stuff. If you don't wanna spend any money like me, I don't like spending money if I don't have to. These are great uh, options to get all kinds of information, get the uh, sky maps from what's out tonight or go to skymaps.com. They have great um, uh, sky maps to print out. This is a great uh, planisphere, online planisphere, terrific heavens above. We all use that to find out where the ISS is and he has other things you can do there. Sky and Telescope has a sky chart. 
Sky and Telescope also has observing news information. Uh, the Naval Observatory has a Sky This Week article every every week. Uh, AstroPixels has another almanac similar to what I just uh, did for you. If you're into variable stars, you want to go to the AAVSO site. And of course, our Facebook public fan page. We always post a lot of interesting information that's really focused on beginners. So I definitely recommend that for you to follow that on Facebook if you are a, a, a Facebook person. And that's it. And I'll see you next month. And uh, pretty much I did my half an hour. You're going to have it back, Richard. Thanks, John. Thank you very much. You're so that does um, conclude our meeting for this month. Um, congratulations to the, um, the new and current board, uh, Tricia, uh, Frank, Denise, and um, Kent, of course, and uh, Mark Bernal, our new, new guy. This is my last meeting as president uh maybe one day down the road but uh i'm done for a while now it's been uh, a pleasure and an honor for the last few years thanks for sticking by i um took on uh, just before the pandemic and so it's been uh, <laughs> it's been an interesting experience so i will post this on the video youtube channel um over the next sometime over the next couple of days um thanks everybody for your time tonight and uh have a great night. Be careful, be safe, and uh, keep looking up and all that stuff.